Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. And I want to read verses 1 through 22. And I was kind of just wondering which direction to go in for this service. And I just felt like the Lord uh, just kind of put something in my heart. I was kind of struggling a little bit. I wanted to... Um, I know I, I, I know I have a liberty and I appreciate that liberty, but um, sometimes when we get the, um, a theme like this, I kind of want to stick with it best I can. And I was asking the Lord, how do you want me to do this? What do you want me to do? And um, this is just the direction I really felt led to go in. So I want to begin there in Joshua chapter 2. Now while you're turning there, I want to just look around for a second. I see a lot of people that I've seen before that I recognize. Some are friends and um, and it's so good to see y'all and I'm so thankful to see a lot of familiar faces and then also to see a lot of brand new faces. And it's always wonderful. I, I think about this a lot. Um, it's always wonderful that no matter where I travel, no matter where I go, uh, that I have family, and I'm grateful for that. You know, we say that sometimes. We talk about it, um, how that years ago, we used to say brother and sister a lot. I notice you still say it, and um, and I do too at many times. Sometimes people say, don't call me brother or sister. It makes me sound old, but I still love it, and the reason I still love it is because of just that fact that you can be in Oklahoma, or you can be in California, or you can be in Michigan, or wherever, and still have family. Family. And I'm grateful for that because we are family through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. So look at your neighbor and say, hey, sister. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Say, now don't get on my nerves like my blood sister. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> It's good to have sisters, isn't it? It really is. I was talking to somebody the other day, and uh, they were going through something, and they said, what would I do without my church family? What would I do without a family like this? And so I recognize and know that you've come from different churches and, and all around and different places, but how cool that we're going to spend eternity together. Amen. How amazing uh, that even though we're just here on this one service at Allegood Church of God, uh, but we're going to be in heaven together. We're going to be worshiping around his throne together. Aren't you thankful for that? How powerful that is today. Amen. And so I love opportunities like this to come and uh, when churches in the area come together and, and just fellowship with each other because this is what heaven's going to look like. Amen. Except it's probably going to be a lot louder. Woo! -hoo! Amen. <laughs> it is. It's going to be a lot louder. I, um, I'll just say real quickly today, most of you, um, some of you may know me, but probably a lot of you don't. Uh, I, only got, I only got married 10 years ago. Can you believe it? Uh, for those of you that were with me through all those many dangerous toils and snares, uh, it feels like how in the world could it have been 10 years that uh, I've been married now, never married until I was um, 22, now I'm 32, and uh, not real. I'm a little older than that. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you when I got married. Uh, so uh, now, because you'll start figuring out my age, uh, but I can tell you today that I would, I don't know, I really believe that I'm married today because of probably my mother and my grandmother's prayers. I think uh, Mama, my grandmother lived to be 90 and uh, went to heaven, just an amazing woman of God. And uh, everybody would say that. They'd say, wow, your grandmother's just doing so good. She's just getting around so good. You know, they'd tell me all that. I'd say, yes, she is. She's hanging on. She's praying I get married before she goes to heaven. I think that's why she hung around as long as she did because she was ready to go to heaven a long time ago. Uh, but she, she beat me to it, though. She went ahead and went on to heaven, and, and he showed up a little later. Actually, I want to talk to you just for a second. Uh, actually, what happened is uh, for any of you, you that are single, I won't make you raise your hand, uh, but any of you that are single and you're going, my goodness, I sure wish that I could be married. I'm tired of being single. Well, uh, if this encourages you at all, let me just say, um, I went on a mission trip to Beijing, China, and that is where I met my husband. Isn't that crazy? We both are from Georgia, but we did not meet until we got to Beijing, and so all of my friends was like, you know he's, met, he's, he's single, and all of his friends was going, you know she's single, and you know how that is. You, you may not. If you've been married since you're 12, you don't get it, uh, but I can tell you 
That's what it feels like when you've been singing along. Everybody goes, I want to tell you what God did. I said, look, you've been married since you was 12 years old. Don't tell me what it's like to be single. And so, uh, but I can tell you for all of us that was single for so many years, people would go, uh, they'd try to set you up all the time, all the time. And they would always point and point, oh, yeah. So when they saw him, they said, you know he's single. I said, he's not my type. I don't like him. Uh, please don't make me have to spend my whole trip in China worried about that. Little did I know, he's on the other side of the room telling his friend, she's not my type, I'm not interested, no, no, no. And so um, I don't know exactly how it happened, but God, you know what I mean? We were long-distance friends even after China for about six years, and come about the seventh year, I don't know. Um, I went to, um, I was preaching in Kentucky, and I flew into Atlanta, and um, he he was in town, and I said, hey, let's just meet for dinner. We were just buddies, really, we were, and uh, I had no interest in him whatsoever. <laughs> it's a little embarrassing to admit it now, but anyway, uh, he said, he said he, he heard the voice of God way before I did. <laughs> that's his claim to fame, is that he heard about it. He knew it before I did. Well, I, that's the truth. I didn't, and so he shows up. And I was like, let's go to dinner. But when I saw him, I thought, something looks different about you. <laughs> I don't know if anybody can appreciate that. I thought, something's different. What in the world, you know? And um, so we went to dinner, and I thought, Lord, help. He's looking better and better. <laughs> I thought maybe it was a nice place we ate. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, I can tell you that uh, the Lord just had a end in it all. And uh, a lot of people were so worried about it because I was in ministry for a number, a lot of years. And uh, I had so many people worried. And they said, um, oh, Beth, what if he's not the right one? Beth, what about this? I mean, I had so many people calling me. and and um, But, you know, I can't really explain this in this short amount of time. But when you know, you know, you know. And uh, But when you don't know, don't. Don't act like you do. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. If there's like two red flags, don't do it. <laughs> Wait till you know that you know that you know that you, and then know again. And uh, and so I could tell you today, I could not have found a greater man in all the world if I had searched him out and 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 Googled him and all that all by myself. I, I, I'm telling you, it's just from the Lord. And so now we're getting to pastor together, and um, he's the greatest pastor. I'm very average. I'm working on it. I'm more of an evangelist, and uh, but he does a great job. But I just want to encourage you. Uh, we've got a trip to China coming up. How many of you want to go? <laughs> Not really. We don't. <laughs> but just in case you're single and looking, I'm telling you, there's a place. Uh, at least go to Mexico. Go somewhere on a mission trip. See what happens. I mean, you never know. No. Plus, you'll be doing something good for the kingdom. Uh, but I can tell you today, I, um, he asked me uh, before we got married, he said, uh, do you think you want, do you think, you know, would we want children? I was like, are you serious? I mean, I'm not going to tell you. I was in my early 40s. I'll just tell you. And so uh, I said, are you serious? I'm exhausted. I said, there's no way at this age I could ever have children. And so, um, but I do, I'll just go ahead and tell you, I do have a little dog. I don't put him in a stroller, but I love him like a child. <laughs> so if you put yours in a stroller, I think you're weird. But <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> Uh, but I will tell you, I do love him. It's embarrassing how much I love him. Uh, but I've never had children of my own. But I have nieces and nephews that I love dearly. And, and uh, I'll tell you the truth. I take them out to eat. I said, don't you put me in a nursing home. I said, you hear me? Don't you do it. I said, I'm going to stay at your house when I get old. <laughs> and so um, I do. I have wonderful nieces and nephews and family that I love so much. They're like my own. And so that's a little bit about me. But when the Lord called me to preach... Um, it was really amazing. I'll just say this, and I'm going to go right through the Word. But when the Lord called me to preach, it's the craziest thing that Ellen and, and uh, Robin are here today uh, because I think it's worth a little time right here. Listen, I mean, what y'all going to do it Saturday? We're just going to go eat in a minute. So let me just give this to you because it will encourage you, I think. Um, I remember when the Lord called me to preach, I was singing. I'm not much of a singer now, and I probably never have been, but I used to enjoy it. Uh, but uh, I was with I was with Sister Ellen, and um, we were had a little pray, had a praise team, and we were singing at a women's conference, and it was a big, a lot of people there, at least for me. Um, it was a lot of people there, and um, and so my friend Robin was there, and and um, 
so I, I don't know, it's such a long story, but the bottom line is the Lord, uh, I heard him, uh, first time I'd ever heard the audible voice of the Lord. And um, he spoke to me so clearly in the room where I was at. I was all by myself. Uh, the women were, you know how it is, ladies. We were running up and down the, the halls playing and laughing and having a great time. And, uh, but I was, I was not feeling well, so I went to bed. I was on the top bunk because I was the youngest. So I was on the top bunk. And I, and I heard the voice of the Lord just as clear as you hear my voice, maybe clearer. And I heard him say, it's very simple, so I know it's hard for you to understand maybe, but he's, I heard the Lord say, preach. I had my Bible, I was reading my Bible, and I thought, it was so loud, I thought, is somebody hiding in the bathroom? And so I kind of looked, I thought, I don't see anybody. I looked around, and I thought, God, I said, God, is that you? And I said, I was, so, I was young, I was so young, and I said, um, Lord, if that is you, you're going to um, you're gonna have to say that again. I mean, my heart was pounding, and I was nervous. I was shaking. I said, so I started reading my Bible again. I have no idea at this point what I was reading. I probably didn't then either. I was just trying to look and focus. And again, I heard the voice of the Lord so clear. He said, preach. And I said, Lord, I said, if that's you, if that's you, you're going to have to tell me again. And I said, um, it's the truth. And I said, you're going to have to make every light as I drive down the middle of town turn green. All at the same. No, I didn't do that, but I wanted to because I was like, Lord, help. Could that really be you? And so I did tell him. I said, Lord, you're going to have to tell me one more time. I'm single. I'm young. I'm a female. What in the world are you thinking? I get nervous when I get in front of people. And so the next morning, I went to the um, I went to the women's conference and when I got in there it was amazing we sang and a message was given out in tongues and the interpretation and the interpretation was that uh, and I can't give it to you exactly but it was along the lines of there is there's a women here that I'm calling to preach the gospel and da 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 went along that I was like oh my goodness well uh, Robin was sitting beside me and I, I was I started crying I mean that I was trying to sit over to the side where people couldn't see but I started crying. I thought, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to go out. And about the time the lady got up to preach and she said that message in tongues and that interpretation confirms my message for today. God has told me that he's calling women right here to preach the gospel. And I'm telling you, I thought, oh my goodness. Robin is like, Beth, what is wrong with you? What is wrong? I was like, oh, I can't tell you. And she said, what is it? What is it? I mean, I, I guess she thought I was sick. And I said, I, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. We got in the car. I mean, I sobbed all the way through it, like quietly, just trying to get through, get away from those women to get in that car. I mean, my, I was shaking. I was nervous. I said, dear Lord, help me, Jesus. And so I used to sing at our church and sing in the choir and sing solos and stuff like that. Anyway, and uh, so a lot of times the pastor would ask me to test. Justify. But that's all. I mean, that was only under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I, I'm not good at that. And so uh, I got in the car and she said, now, I'm not going anywhere until you tell me what is wrong with you. I said, Robin, you're not going to believe it. I said, don't tell a soul. Don't tell anybody, nobody. But I think God's calling me to preach. That's about the way it happened. I was like, Whoa. And she said, Beth, get a hold of yourself. She said, everybody knows that. I said, well, I didn't know it. <laughs> so anyway, it was a surprise to me, but evidently nobody else. And, uh, but that's just like the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Y'all are quiet. That's just like the Lord, isn't it? Hasn't he done wonderful things for you like that to just blow your mind, to make you go look at God, to make you say, how big is God? How big and wide his vast domain. Hallelujah. How wonderful you are, oh Lord. Oh my goodness. He's so powerful. He's so wonderful. And don't think for a moment that he's not looking down in time right here today and that he doesn't see you and he doesn't know where you are and he doesn't know what's going on in your life oh yes he does amen and I believe without a shadow of a doubt that you might just think that all a good church of God just thought they were going to have a women's conference and they just thought this sounds like a good idea but little did you know hallelujah that God has had a plan from the beginning and he wants to speak to you today Woo! hallelujah
Hallelujah. You just thought it was another women's conference. Who knows? God might be calling some of you out into ministry, calling you out into a position, calling you out to use you in these last days. My goodness, anything can happen at a women's conference. Amen. Oh, why? Why? You say, why do you feel like that calls you? Come in here hungry. Uh, like somebody's already said, you're here on a Saturday morning. My goodness, anything can happen today. Woo! Praise the Lord. It's exciting, isn't it? Praise the Lord. Well, let's go to Joshua. I won't preach too long today with the help of the Lord. So y'all pray. If you don't have nothing else to pray about now, you do. Amen. So let's look at Joshua chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. It says, And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went out and came into a harlot's house named Rahab, and they lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee which are entered into thine house for they be come to search out the country, all the country and the women took the two men and hid them and said thus, there came men unto me but I don't know where they are uh, now what she's doing right there in case you don't know, she's lying all right, so verse 5, and it says, And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Again, she's still, she's not telling the truth right there. She's hiding these men. Whether the men went, I don't know. Pursue after them quickly, for you shall overtake them. But verse 6 says, But she had brought them up to the roof of her house, and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them by the way of Jordan unto the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites, which were on the other side of Jordan, Sahan and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And she said, as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God. Amen. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Verse 12 says, now, listen to her now. Here's powerful. She says, now, therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. Now there's more today. Uh, let me just keep reading a little bit more. It says, And the men answered her and said, Our lives for yours, if you utter not this our business. And it shall be that when the Lord hath given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. And she said unto them, Get you to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you, and hide yourself there for three days until the pursuers be returned and after you afterward you may go your way and the men said we'll be blameless of this thine oath that thou hast made us swear behold when we come into the land thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by and thou shalt bring thy father thy mother thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee and it says, And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thine house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in thine house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. And if thou utter this our business, then we will be quit of thine oath, which thou hast made us to swear. According to your word, she said, so be it. And she sent them away and departed, and she bound the scarlet line in the window. That is so 
powerful right there. Let's stop. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Would you pray aloud with me today? Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I praise you. I give you all the glory and honor for everything you've already done and all that you are going to do in the lives and the hearts of these ladies. Lord, I pray that you would minister to them in such a supernatural way. Lord, that they would have to leave out of here and say we've been in the presence of the Lord. Lord, I pray for a fresh anointing on me, an anointing to deliver this word, but also an anointing on their ears to hear and to receive. And Lord, we give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody shout it out, amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to just take a few moments today, and I want to talk a little bit about Rahab, but a lot about you. Amen. I want to tell you a little bit about Rahab. The first thing that I see there in verse 1, uh, I think it's so important that we just kind of pick this apart for a few minutes, but in chapter 2 and verse 1, uh, the Bible teaches us that spies had been sent into Jericho to check it out. Spies had been sent there, and I sent there, and I believe that Joshua sent the spies there because he had planned to take Jericho by force. I believe that Joshua's got in his mind uh, the way that uh, I guess you would say normal uh, commanders would go out and take a city. But we all know because we know the end of the story what happened. We all know how the walls of Jericho fell. We all know. Uh, that God sent the people of Israel to march around those walls. And you remember, and I won't go into all of it, but to march around those walls once a day for six days and on the seventh day to march around for seven times. And they did it in silence for the first six times. And then the seventh time on the seventh day is when they begin to shout unto the Lord and blow the trumpet. And it's just powerful. And we know that the walls fell. You and I know that. Joshua did not know that. Joshua was at the beginning of the story. He didn't have the Bible to read like you and I do. He was right in the thick of things. And so I believe that he said, look, this is what we want to do. I want you spies to go into Jericho. I want you to check it out. I want you to look at the walls. I want you to see how thick the walls are. I want you to go in and find out where every guard is stationed. I want you to find out what kind of weapons they have and what kind of artillery they have. Go in and check this place out because I know God has told us he's going to give us this city. I want to know what kind of a, a fortress this city really is, what kind of walls they have. And I, I truly believe that was his idea, his thoughts about it. Get some spies to go in and to check it out. Uh, I can tell you though that was not God's plan. God was not concerned with how thick the walls were, although they were thick enough uh, that they would have chariot races on the top of them. That's how thick they were. Uh, I don't think God was concerned a bit about where the soldiers were planted, where the uh, those that were on the lookout, where they might have been. I don't believe it at all. Uh, maybe God had uh, the uh, God had the spies go in so they could come back and tell Joshua just how impossible it was going to be for Joshua and the army to be able to take that city. Maybe that was part of it, but I believe without a doubt there was another reason that Joshua sent those spies in. I believe there was another reason that those spies had to go in and check check everything out, and I believe it was because there was a woman there by the name of Rahab, and Rahab wanted to be saved. Amen. I want to say that again. I said I believe it's because God said there's a woman by the name of Rahab and she might be a harlot. She might be a prostitute but she's called out on me and I've heard her secret cries and I've seen the secret tears and I know something's going on in her and if I have to stop everything, I'll stop everything to save a woman. Amen. I'll stop everything to turn things around for Rahab. Amen. 
That's so powerful to me because when you look at Jericho, you and I can see, and I won't get into a lot of the background and the detail of this, but we all can see that Jericho is really coming under judgment. Jericho, the Lord has looked and, 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 and everything that was happening there, the Lord said, I'm going to go ahead and give you this city. Uh, we're gonna, things are going to change in that city. Judgment is coming. And I believe today in the time that we're living in that we also can look around. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist or a prophetess or anybody else to be able to tell it uh, today that judgment is coming to America. And that certainly we can look and see what's happening on our left and on our right. Certainly we can open our eyes. All you have to do is open one eye and you can see that judgment is coming and that America is in a difficult place. We can feel it, can't we? You can sense it. You can look around and go, something's happening here and I don't know what it's all going to look like, but I can tell you something is going on. Well, you can know today that that same thing was happening in Jericho. You can know that Rahab could feel it. Matter of fact, notice what she did when she got those men and she hid those men out. I think it's amazing because she was a harlot, the Bible says. And so no doubt she's used to a lot of different men coming around her. No doubt she's used to seeing a lot of different types of men. But there was something different when these two spies walked in. I'll tell you it's so powerful to me because I believe she looked at them and said something's different about these guys. These guys are not the same kind of guys I'm used to. These men aren't the same kind of men I'm used to. I believe she looked and said, my goodness, something's going on right here. And I recognize that same stirring in my heart that I've been feeling about this judgment that's coming. I feel like these men may have something that can help me. They may have a way out. Woo! I love it because she looked at those men there and she said, hey, I know who you are and I know who your God is. And we've already heard about what your God can do. And we already heard about what he's done over here and what he's done over here. And our hearts have melted in fear. I love what Rahab does right here because she hides them. And she said, I believe I've got to take it out of here. I believe I've got an answer. I believe I've got some hope. And it's all because two men took a risk and said, I'll be the spy. Let me go in. Let me deliver the truth. Let me share it. Amen. Woo. It's exciting, isn't it? Those men could have been up there on that roof of that house where she hit them. And they could have said, I don't know what you're talking about, Rahab. We're just two men. We're just two regular old men. You might as well let us go. We're going to go down. Uh, you know, you might as well just uh, just stop all of this because uh, you don't know who you're talking to. But I'm so thankful for two men that never said that. Amen. I'm so thankful for two men that looked and saw an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. I'm so thankful for two men uh, that could have said we're here on a on a military uh, assignment uh, you need to settle down Rahab we're here on a on a mission we're here on ministry business that's what they could have said but I'm so thankful for two men uh, that recognize what God wanted to do in spite of everything that they were there for in spite of all the ministry they were involved in I'm so grateful for two men uh, that stopped in all of that business and said, you know what? I sense God's doing something bigger than me. I sense God's doing something bigger than a military briefing. I sense God's doing something bigger than me going back to Joshua and saying, Joshua, let me tell you what I found. And them, uh, them holding up those two men and saying, look what happened with them over in Jericho. They said, my goodness, uh, I see God doing something uh, that's going to far outweigh any kind of military information that I'll ever be able to give. Hallelujah. Now, I will tell you, I will slow down for a minute now. I know we're going to get to broken crayons, and you're probably thinking, how in the world? I'm not sure either right yet, but I think it's coming. Amen. But I'll tell you something. I'll look here, and i see those men there, and that woman, and she says, I want you to know. She said, you know what kind of house you come to? 
you, I know why you come here. I'll just tell you the truth. The reason that they went there is because a lot of the military personnel and a lot of the leaders in, in Jericho would go to her house, would go to that area, that place. And so they knew that if they would go there, that most likely they would be able to hear some things that they could go back and tell Joshua. That's why they were there. They knew that if they got to that place where a lot of men were in and out of, they would maybe be able to hear some secrets and some information and see some things that they wouldn't have been able to see any other way. Little did they know they were going to a harlot's house who was desperate for help. Amen. Uh, little did they know, but God knew. God knew. Little did you think about when you walked in the doors of Alla Good Church of God that God had a plan like this for you today. Amen. Uh, but I can tell you something. God knew. God knew who was coming. God knew who was going to park in that parking space out there. God knew when you walked in these doors what you really needed. You just thought you were coming to appease a friend. You just thought you were coming because you promised somebody you would. Amen. You just thought you were coming to have a good lunch afterwards. Oh, but God knew why you were coming. And God made a plan of what he wanted to do in your life today. Amen. Oh, yes, he did. Hallelujah. And that's what, hap what we see happening right here with this woman by the name of Rahab. Now I want you to think about something, if you would. Because when I look at Rahab, this is very interesting to me and not enough time really to go into it, and I'm, I'm not an expert on it. But I can tell you today that when I look at the, um, the Canaanite religion and all that they were involved in, it was a wicked, wicked thing. You would see that uh, prostitution, what she did was uh, looked upon very highly. It was a honorable profession at that time. Uh, this horrible uh, time that they lived in, they um, sacrificing babies was nothing for them. It was just part of life. You look at them and you see that um, so many things that they would do was just horribly, horribly wicked. But isn't it amazing? That even when society around you says this is good, this is okay, this is acceptable, that really deep down in the heart of hearts, hallelujah, deep down in our hearts of hearts, I don't care what culture says, I don't care what society says, we know that we know because when the Lord begins to move inside of us, even though they applauded her position and what she did, her profession, she knew in her heart of hearts that there there's something not right. There's something that's wounding. There's something that's hurting. There's something that feels like it's just ripping me apart. I can tell you something about sin today. Uh, the world around may say it's fine, but when sin is in our hearts like that and it begins to eat away at our very being, that's what sin will do. And I don't care who's telling you that you're doing a great job. I'm telling you through the power of the Holy Spirit, amen, through the conviction power, power of the Lord. He comes in and he moves just like he did in Rahab. Rahab said, I've got the best of the best. I, I, am, I am applauded by the best of the best. But nevertheless, I can tell there's something in me that's not right. I can tell you there's something in me that doesn't feel good. I can tell you there's something in me that's eating away at me and I can't live like this anymore. Amen. I don't want to live like this. I don't want to be like this. I don't want to act like this. And she saw those men and she said, I believe I found a way. Amen. I love that. I believe she looked at those men and said, I believe I found a way out of this. So you may say, Beth, why would you tell me, talk about this on this day for all of us? Well, I'll just tell you without a doubt. I want you to notice something that she says in Joshua 2 and verse 9. Notice it says, and she said to the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land. I know judgment is coming and that your terror is falling upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. This is what she did. She said, I know I'm going to die. I know I'm about to go under. I know this is the end, but can you help me? I don't know about you today, but I want you to stop for a moment and just think about who is it that you're in contact with regularly that maybe they don't ever say it with their words as bold as Rahab may have but they tell you in so many other ways I need help 
I'm telling you, it may be people in your family. We're coming up on Thanksgiving. It may be people you're going to sit around the table with. It may be the one you're going to you're going to carve that turkey with. That's really they may not say it with their words, but their actions are saying, "I need help. I need hope. I need a way out of the place that I'm in." And you know, I pray today. I say, God, give us the wisdom and give us the discerning the, through the power of the Holy Ghost to recognize what that's really going on in that life, in that woman, in that man, in that child around us. I think about that, don't you? I think about people I work with and how many of them have cried out for help, but sometimes we just walked away. I think about people that I may even walk by in the aisle at Walmart and how many times I may feel the moving of the Holy Spirit, but instead I just walk by them and I don't really, I, I, I'm I'm, I'm so busy doing what I got there to do. I don't really recognize that there's a need walking right by me. There's somebody that's shouting out for help that says, my goodness, I need help in the place that I'm in. I need hope in the place that I'm at. I told Kirk the other day, I said, you know, this is what I feel like. This is what I feel like is happening around us. I feel like in the world that we're living in, people have lost hope. People have lost hope in the church. People have lost hope in politics. People have lost hope in everything around us. People have lost hope in family. People have lost hope in their friends. And it seems like we're in a time where there's such hopelessness. I talk to people all the time. And they're on all kinds of medication. Their children are on all kinds of medication. I talked to a woman the other day. She's got a five-year-old son. And she said, oh, he's just, he has so much anxiety. I thought, what in the world? And how is that happening? He's never made a car payment. He's never had to worry about where his food's going to come from. He never even worries what kind of clothes he's going to put on his back. How in the world could you have anxiety? And I believe it is a spirit that has come through our land Amen. I believe that. It is a spirit that has come through our land. It is a spirit that has come into our churches. It is a spirit that's attacking women, but also men, and also our children. Amen. It, I see it happening all the time. And I, I, I can promise you without a doubt, it's going to be a neighbor. It's going to be somebody close to you that you may say, they never told me, but my goodness, open your eyes up. Open our spiritual eyes and say, but I can recognize something's not right. I recognize something doesn't settle right. I recognize there's somebody calling for, screaming for help, even though they've never even opened their mouth. I say, oh, God, help us to be the church in the last days. Help us, ladies, to be the church in the last days. Like we see these spies who said, yes, I'm busy doing this. And I'm busy. Come on, you're busy taking care of your family. You're busy taking care of ministry. You're busy in your work. You're busy taking care of your house but my goodness how many of you know and agree with me today that all of this is going to fail all of this is going to go away all this stuff you know all this is going away but I can tell you what's eternal amen and that is a life that is saved that is one that says one that says can you help me and you be able to take them and point them to Jesus Christ that's eternal that's going to last today amen Woo. Praise the Lord. I could go on and on about that because really I believe what Rahab was saying here. She was saying, tell me how to be saved. Amen. How can I be saved? I want you to think about it today. We've got these Israelites, two million, and they are ready to go over Jordan. And they are ready to destroy everything in sight. Think about it now. These Israelites, they've waited 40 years for the promised land. But God says, ho, stop everything. Stop everything. I don't want anything to happen. I want you to send two spies over into Jericho. Don't you love the Lord? He said, hold on, hold on, everybody stop. I know y'all been waiting 40 years. But we're going to give it three more days. Amen. And he sends those spies over there. Why? Because Rahab says, I want to be saved. I want my mama saved. I want my daddy saved. I want my brother saved. I want my sister saved. Oh, I'm so thankful today that the Lord sees beyond just our scope of view today. And he sees what's over the hill and around the corner. He sees what's happening over there. I'm so thankful 
to the Lord today. Amen. And that's what we see. He loves so much that he's not willing that any should perish. Amen. Woo. You know what it reminds me of? This also reminds me of Jesus. It reminds me of Jesus when he's heading down the road with his disciples. And you know what he said? He said, I need to go through Samaria. Really? I mean, his disciples are going, why? We never go through Samaria. Why don't you just be like the rest of the Jews and we go around that? Why do you have to go? Oh, but you and I know why. Amen. You, we know why. Oh, I'm telling you, he's, he, had, he said, y'all go ahead and do what you need to do. I'm going to go on through Samaria. And he goes in and there's a woman at the well. Y'all know the story. Amen. And she's been married five times and she's living with a man now. And he tells her all that she's ever done. Amen. And she says, he says, drink of this water. Amen. I know what you're doing. You're going to this well for this kind of water. He said, let me tell you about a water that you can drink of and never thirst again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What in the world? I'll tell you what it is. The Lord said, I can hear somebody crying. I can hear somebody calling. I can hear somebody pleading. I can hear somebody that they're at the end of their road. Woo! And he heads down through Samaria. And he sees her. He said, let me tell you. And you remember what she said. She said, sir. Give me this water. Amen. Give me this water that you're talking about. Woo. I'll tell you, that's what God's still doing today. I believe that's what the Lord is still doing today. And then I have to go on to Matthew 9. I love this. Jesus is on his way to heal the daughter by the name of, by, uh, by the daughter of a man by the name of Jairus. And you may remember what happened. A woman comes out of that apartment wherever she lived and she was never supposed to come out in the middle of people and she touched the hem of his garment and he stopped everything on his way to heal the daughter of a nobleman on the way to heal the daughter of a man that was pretty high up in, in the religious world. He said, but he said, I'm not too busy that I can't stop for a woman that's been suffering for 12 years. Amen. And do you remember what he did? He didn't turn around and say, okay, now you're healed. Get on away from me. He didn't do that. He said, daughter, <laughs> woo. He said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Hallelujah. You can know today that our same father, our same Lord has stopped by this church this morning and he's saying hold on I'll stop everything on this Saturday morning because I've heard a cry I'll stop everything on this Saturday morning because I've seen your tears I'll stop everything on this Saturday morning because I know somebody is different somebody's desperate for hope somebody's desperate for joy again somebody's desperate for peace again in their lives. Woo. I feel the Lord today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you remember what happened? They said, put this scarlet cord out of your window. And you remember what that scarlet cord was all about. If you don't, I'll just tell you briefly. But I believe without a shadow of a doubt that those Israelites said, if you will put that red cord out of that window, we'll recognize your house. And when we come back, everything else might be destroyed. But whoever's in that house, I believe those men said, put the red cord in your window. Because it reminds us of the blood of, of the blood blood of the lamb that was on the doorpost of the home when the death angel passed over. I believe they said the death angel is coming, but where the blood is applied. Amen. Woo. Oh my goodness, isn't that good? Oh, let's keep going. And you know what happened. You, you know what happened. Sure enough, keep on reading. You can read it yourself. You need to read it when you go home. Sure enough, they came in. They marched on the seventh day, marched for the seventh time, blew the trumpets, get shouted to the Lord, and the walls disintegrated. The Bible says it was almost like that the ground swallowed them up. Amen. Because if the walls that thick had have fallen, they would have had to climb over all of that. That would have been a disaster. But no, I don't think God's going, oh, I didn't think about that. No, he thought about it. Amen. And the ground just opened almost swallowed up that and they went right in and they took Jericho and guess what didn't fall it's a house 
that a woman by the name of Rahab was in and all of her family was in. How do I know? Because number one, the Bible says, but also how do I know? Because in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, there's a woman by the name of Rahab. Amen. You say a harlot, a prostitute? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, because she had been changed, because she was a new creature, because things were were different in her life. Amen. Yes. Woo. I could preach all day long right there. That's powerful, isn't it? But I want you to think about this today, if you would. I think about Rahab and think about what's happening there. But I want to I want to take you to another place. This is what I just really feel like the Lord wants me to come back just a little bit to this. I didn't really know how I was going to do it, but I want to talk to you today. I'm talking about a woman by the name of Rahab. But I want to talk to you today. Maybe your name's not Rahab. Maybe you've never heard of anybody by the name of Rahab except this woman. But nevertheless, you could put your name in that story. You could put your name in that place. And you may say, Beth, I feel like a Rahab. I feel like I'm broken. I feel like I'm used. I feel like I've been abused. I feel like if somebody else didn't do it, I did it to my own self. Somebody in here possibly, you say, Beth, it's me. Maybe you say it's not prostitution that I've had to deal with. Maybe today it's something completely different from that. But nevertheless, you could say there's broken, hurt places in me. And I've wondered, could God ever do anything with this mess? Maybe today you come in, you look good. We've got, a, we've got a way of doing that, don't we? Thank God for makeup. We've got a good way of fixing up and looking good and hiding a lot of things. We can do it. We can do it with the best of them. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of a clay pot. I don't have one today, but I've got some on my porch. A clay pot. And on this clay pot, you know what it's like if you've got a little crack in that thing. You can hide it. You can pull it to the back. But then it won't be long after I've been out there a few times, hit it accidentally. Kurt goes out and knocks it over again, that little crack. That little chip turns into a a crack. And then before you know it, the crack gets bigger. And then when we try to water that plant that's in that pot, more water goes out of that crack than stays in and takes care of the plant. The plant begins to wither because of that crack that's so prominent in the back. Nobody riding down the road can see it. Nobody even coming up our driveway can see it. But I can see it. And I know that crack is there. And I know it's visible. And I know every time that we want to water that thing, every time we want to put plant food in there, more of that stuff comes out than what happens in that pot or that plant. Kind of reminds me of Rahab. <laughs> Kind of reminds me of Rahab. Everybody around her said she's looking good. Everybody around her said she's got it made in the shade. She's making some money. Everybody around her said everybody's clapping and applauding Rahab because she was a priestess in the Canaanite religion. That's what, that, that's what would happen in that type of industry there. So she wasn't somebody low on the totem pole. I mean, my goodness, they exalted her. And they would look at her, but there was a big crack down the back. There was a big crack that started probably right up here in this mind. And as life went on and terrible things happened, it would get more and more prominent, bigger and bigger. She started looking around and saying, how can I have help? What can I do? And some of you today are just like that. It may not be, again, I want to say it may not be prostitution. It may be something else. It may be a wound. It may be a rejection. It may be something the enemy has tried to do in your life. It may be the loss of a loved one that you've not been able to get over. But you come in and out and you're looking pretty good. Until the crack is noticed. Until the chip. And you look around and God wants to move in you. God wants to do something marvelous. But every time he wants to pour out in you, it seems like more pours out. Then what is there to touch your life and to touch your heart? And you know what it reminds me of today? It reminds me of a place. I I love this. I'm going to jump up here right quick in my scripture. It reminds me of Jeremiah chapter 18. 
And in Jeremiah chapter 18, God sends Jeremiah down to the potter's house. Sends him to the potter's house. I won't go into all of it. I want to take it from a national level to a personal level right here. And Jeremiah saw some pottery, saw some clay on the potter's wheel. And in that pottery, that clay that was on the potter's wheel, he saw a mess in it. He saw issues with it. And then he saw that potter. And he took that clay and he put it back together. He begins to put his hands on it and mold it again and make it over again into something beautiful. Maybe today you feel like a Rahab. And you say, Beth, I've got a stick in me. Beth, I've got a big stone in me. Beth, I've got an issue over here that I don't know exactly how I'm going to manage. I know God's got a calling on my life. I know God wants to do something in me. I know he's not left me here in Jericho just to let me die. But I'm telling you, I've got such a stick in me right now. I've got such a problem in my heart right now. I don't know what I'm going to do, and I don't know how I'm going to do it. Or maybe today, you're the one who doesn't have a stick, nor do you have a rock in your clay. But it could be you're the one that you've been crushed. And there's a place called the potter's field. And you've been crushed so horribly that they have completely discarded you and said you could never be used again. Oh, my goodness. Maybe you're here. And you say, you don't know my past. You don't know my life. You don't know what I've done. But I can tell you how it feels for me. Because there's people I know in every church I go to. Again, I don't have to be a prophetess to know this. And you look around and you go, I don't know how God could do it in me. I don't know what in the world could ever happen, how God could ever do it in me. But I want to tell you something about a place called the potter's field. And any time that a piece of pottery was just broken into pieces, into shards, and could never be used again in the eye of an average potter. He would throw it out into the potter's field. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's you today. You say, it's my life. People look at me and they know what I've done. People look at me and they know where I've come from. But I want to tell you something about a master potter. And the master potter will come into a potter's field. And what looks like to an average potter, it just looks like old clay. Old broken up clay. But when the master potter comes in, he said, I see something right here. Normal, average eyes have overlooked it. <laughs> Maybe people around that potter's field has overlooked it. Not the master potter. For the master potter comes in and he puts his hand down in that. And he said, look at that. And he brings up a little piece. And it looks like nobody could ever use this. But not to the master potter. He said, I see something in there. Don't you think that when the Lord saw Rahab... <laughs> And everybody saw Rahab as just a shattered old piece, used up. Oh, only the men saw her good for anything. Oh, but the master potter reached down and he said, But I see something in you. Little did we know it was going to be Jesus Christ. Amen. Little did we know she would be in the lineage of Jesus Christ. And he picks those pieces up and he says, Oh, look. And he puts them in something to hold it. He said, Oh, look right here. And he said, Oh, everybody else says overlook this everybody else knows what they've gone through everybody else knows the sin that they've committed everybody else knows the pain that they've gone through everybody else knows the rejection and feels like she can't be used but the master potter will get you and he'll put you back into his hands and he'll begin to take his hands and he'll begin to apply water to you he'll crush you down but after that crushing comes in he'll take what's left he'll crush you down he said, I'm about to use you in a way you never thought you could be used. I'm about to do something in 
you that nobody else saw in you, uh, that nobody ever even considered. Uh, and then he uh, begins to apply the water of the word. Amen. Uh, then he begins to apply the water of the word. Uh, he takes those little pieces. Uh, he applies the water. And all of a sudden, something begins to happen. And there's clay again. How many of you think it's amazing that clay has every element of the human body except breath? Oh, it encourages me because when I think about that clay in the potter's field, I recognize that really what that clay is going to need is when the Lord, the master potter, gets it up and applies the water and he makes it again and then he breathes on us. Amen. And then he breathes that fresh life into us. I'm telling you, nobody else can see your potential. Nobody else knows what's been going on. Nobody else knows deep what's in your heart. But the Lord does. Now I want to tell you today that broken crayon still color. Amen. I want to tell you that broken pieces can still color. I want to tell you that broken pieces can still make a difference. How? How? Only when they're in the hands of the potter. Only when they're in the hands of the master. Oh, thank the Lord if you want to help me close. Only then. And look what the Lord can do. And look what he did for Rahab. And look what he wants to do for you. You go, oh, Beth, I don't know if he can do it for me. Oh, yes. He gently picks it up. There's probably people sitting on the pew with you even. That says, I know. You know? People sitting on the pew that says, oh, I know. They probably do. But I, yep, that's all right. The Lord does too. And it don't make him nervous. And it don't make him ashamed and afraid because he knows the power that's in the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And when you get in the, in the hands of the master potter, he can take what everybody else has rejected and he can make it over again and make you into that beautiful person, that beautiful thing, that beautiful whatever it is that he needs for you to be at this time. Oh, today I want you to stand, if you would, all over this house. Woo, hallelujah. Aren't you so thankful today? The potter, yes. Glory to God. Glory to God, amen. I know sometimes you may be here and you say, Beth, all of my hopes and all of my dreams have been destroyed. But the Lord said, but I still have a plan for your life. You go, my future seems hopeless. God said, no, not with me. I still have a plan. And I can tell you today, you are in the palm of his hand. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads if you would. Oh, today that you and I don't miss the Rahabs around us. So, who is this message for? I kind of went in a couple of different directions. Let me make it clear today. This message is for those of you out here that are like the spies. You're busy doing the Lord's work, sometimes too busy. You're busy being a mother. You're busy being a wife. You're busy taking care of things. But be careful that you don't get too busy because there's Rahabs around you that are screaming for help with a silent voice. I believe the Lord's speaking to somebody today. There may be somebody that you live close to, somebody, like I said earlier, that you'll be sitting at a table with in just a few days eating turkey with, and they're screaming for help. And you know what? In your mind, you may be saying, there's no hope for them, Beth. Oh, I, I, I just sense the power of the Lord right now. They're in my family, but I know so much about them, and there's no hope for them. They're in my family. I love them. But I'm going to tell you, I know what they've done, where they've been. And I know there's no, no future for them. Oh, don't limit the Lord. Don't limit the Lord today. Because he's the master potter. You're not. I'm not. We're not the master potter. But the master potter is here today. And he said, that one that's going to sit beside you, you may say there's no hope for them. There's no way anything good can come out of them. The Lord said, watch what I can do. I'm the master potter. Or maybe today you're the woman here, the Rahab. 
the Rahab. Maybe it's prostitution. I don't know. Maybe it's a broken heart. Maybe it's what we called out earlier, rejection. Maybe it's something in here that you say, Beth, you don't know what I've done to my family. I've tried to put it in the back of my mind, but every time I feel like the Lord's calling me to step out, I can't do it because I know the mess my life has been in. I feel like He's forgiven me, but I still had not learned to forgive myself. Today, the Lord's telling us today, broken crayons still color. And today, He wants to make you whole with your heads bowed, no one looking for just one moment. If you're not where you need to be with the Lord, oh my goodness, there's no time like right now. I know it's a women's conference, but there's no time like right now. If you say, Beth, I'm running from Him. I'm riding the fence. I'm back and forth. Today He's calling you.